So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Q&A for the film Veins of the World, our online opening night film. We are so thrilled to have um, a special guest with us tonight uh, or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, Ansgar is, uh, Frerich is here uh, from Berlin and um, he is the producer of the film. Uh, the director of Veins of the World, Vianda Sarandava, unfortunately is currently in, Mon in Mongolia without internet connection. Uh, so she's not able to join us, but we're so pleased to have Ansgar here, uh, who's one of the film's producers joining us from Berlin. My name's Joanne Parson. I am the director of education for the California Film Institute. Uh, I'm also the family films programmer, and it was my great pleasure to be able to choose this film um, for the Mill Valley Film Festival and um, our opening night online film for the, the family film section. So welcome to Ansgar. Um, and I believe you also developed the story with Biamba and um, Jiska Rickles as well. So you've had, and you've probably played quite a few roles in this film that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of them. Um, but let's maybe start off with what the inspiration for this story was. It's such a beautiful story, but has so many different layers and elements to it. Can you talk a little bit about how that came together? Yeah, actually like, um, I uh, done together with Biamba uh, up to now, I think four films in Mongolia. And first time I went there, it was in 2000, where you can imagine like a country, if you're on the countryside and you, you're hungry, you just step into a river, holding your hands like this into the river and the fish will come quite soon and you just uh, can can put it to the to the ground beside the river, and um, like then we we've been there several times, and uh, in the period about 2010, suddenly uh, more than half of the rivers uh, in the region where we've been were dead, and uh, dead by by mining, especially by by the chemicals that they use to wash out the gold and um, then we we started to research a bit about that and of course the the nomads also told us a lot about it that the people like the international uh, acting um, mining corporations um, that they come to the nomads and they say if you leave to, today you got five thousand dollars if you leave tomorrow you get four thousand and if you leave in a week then you will not get anything so that they don't even have the chance to to gather somehow to to build a union against this um yeah against the system um which is not only a, a matter for mongolia but there we of course had the special uh, entrance to it and yeah and then beside that uh, also because of the personal stories we we um or the personal background of us we developed the story of of a kid from the next generation who just like witness in the childhood the the nomads tradition which is basically that because we're always thinking nomads are the ones that are, that are moving but they actually just moving from uh, spring to summer from summer to autumn or fall from fall to winter and back again so they just have four places we are the one that are the nomads the the new times uh, nomads uh, in this world and when they left the spot um, two weeks later you don't see that there was a human being living there. So their carbon footprint is, uh, should be our aim somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but tragically now they are facing this, um, this uh, global corporations where from, for example, from one of the biggest uh, Canadian corporation, um, the uh, CEO once said what's the great thing on Mongolia is it's vast, it has a lot of resources and there are hardly any NGOs. So this is how we treat this country. And yeah, that was the, the starting point where, where we uh, went over and um, or first we, we developed here a story, a fictional story around that, uh, also based on this personal backgrounds that we had. Uh, and then we went over to shoot 
and um, we had a wonderful main set, uh, main location. And um, three days before shooting, we received a message that all the land um, around was instantly uh, bought by a mining next to it and that they uh, forbid us to, to shoot there. Um, so there we had the first encounter with the, with the strengths of them. And uh, so we, we did a research in the, in the surrounding areas. We, we by some uh, whistleblowers from, <laughs> from um, the, the government, we got a plan where are still nomads lands. And then we found the even nicer and the so beautiful main location, which you see in the film. And we went to the nomad and we developed the, 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 the story really on our fictional, our, on our imagination. Uh, and then we went to the nomad to ask if we can shoot there and he invited us like every Mongolian to his yurt and it was a session of at least four or five hours with a lot of uh, camel tea and and uh, everything that you need to experience there um, and then he told us his story and this story was so similar to what we've written yeah. uh, and he said that he definitely will will support us. We can uh, take the land for the shoot, uh, and he will not move away because of the minings. Because this land should also in the next generations belong to the nomads. And it was really you see it in the last shot how close the minings already got there, and the minings not just. Uh, means that they are the holes, but they they lower the whole groundwater. Mm. So um, the rivers are they are not similar to the groundwaters. You see in the last picture that it's 40 meters just right beside the river it goes down. They dried everything up. So and the the rivers are poisoned. So it's really hard to survive there uh, as a nomad. And this was then the final um, yeah, impact on us that uh, we, we knew, okay, this story needs to be told. So how did you decide to center the story around, around a young boy and having it be from his vantage point? Um, we like, of course, in in a story development, it's a long process. Um, uh, so, in the beginning, the the young point uh, boy was blind, <laughs> and it was about um, um, the legacy uh, because the blindness was passed over. Like the, the, his father wasn't blind, but his grandfather. So it took a long way to. Uh, come to that point and that uh, was initial, uh, initially then um, that we found this old um, legend about uh, the, the wanes of the world, that the world is kind of um, netted out of, of gold and if you take away the last um, vein of, of gold from the earth, the earth will fall to dust. And that, that legend was so poetic that we decided to ask a nomad, uh, a, a, a um, shaman to go for, I think he was on the countryside uh, for a month to create a kind of ode out of it, and a, a hymn that could have been there f since since ages, and um, we wanted to connect that to to the nowadays uh, where like Mongolia Got Talent or um, how these shows are called um, is a kind of also um, yeah vision for for young people to to find their way through this this shows and we wanted to connect this both and there of course we stayed with the with a young boy um with the 
with the essential question, should I continue with the heritage that I get from my, uh, my, my father's generation or mother's generation? Or should I find a new path for myself in this, this uh, case in Ulaanbaatar or beyond? Um, so, yeah, for us, it was so essential to, because it's a film about what, what is the way for the next generation to deal with all of that, to, to uh, base the whole story on, on a boy uh, who suddenly needs to be grown up because his father disappeared. Right. So, so the song was actually created for the film by the shaman. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's. <laughs> but even Mongolians in the in the premiere set, they they knew this song. Yeah. <laughs> they knew the song from their grandparents or something like that. So it's it's in the way of how. Um, how it's written and how it's developed, it's very, let's say, ancient. Um, so it pretty much uh, matches into um, the songbook of Mongolian uh, old tales. And Mongolia's Got Talent is a real show, correct? They, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And they do, they travel around the country looking for new talent, is it? Yeah, th this is one-on-one, uh, -on -one, like like it is there, and we had the we were lucky that um, the the local producers of that show became our co-producers, so that we could really include this original show and not just uh, in, invent a new one for that. That makes sense. So, so how did you cast the film, particularly the kids? Did, are the, were these professional actors or, and was it challenging to find a young actor to play Amr who could also sing? Um, it's uh, like they, they all are kind of pro professional actors, but the, the film uh, world of Mongolia is not that big. So um, Amra, um, our main character, he played a short film before um, uh, and we we traveled more than 10,000 kilometers all over um, the Mongolia to, to, and we cast, I think, like 600 boys and um, yeah, in different regions and uh, yeah, and finally we got him and uh, not that he's uh, a great actor, but he also uh, he's originally singing the, the song and he has this beautiful voice. So they both came together. And also NRL, uh, the mother, um, Zaya, the, the role, and um, Yalalt, uh, the father, Erdene, um, they are real professional actors um, as their main income, let's say. Um, and throughout the shooting they they also stayed in a yurt together uh beside the shoot we all stayed in yurts to to somehow experience also the 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 way of living there and uh, to let it flow into the pr whole production not only into the what you see on camera and they really became a kind of family together and that was really uh great to to witness yeah that's so great um so it sounds like you were on set in mongolia during the production you were there for the whole the whole yeah of course shoot. so what what are the greatest challenges of shooting in a remote region like that the greatest challenge is also the greatest advantage it's you have to um not come as a european team to shoot there. Uh, if you want to experience it and let it also flow into the film, you have to come as, as European guests to, together with, with the Mongolian crew and to, to yeah, find, to be empathic for, for the way how they work there. For example, um, 
we had a problem to get um, the machinery for the shoot, this, this uh, hole digging machine. Normally you say, okay, you go to the next uh, person to, to, and you ask how much the rent will cost. Um, here, you go to that person, you at least need to have four or five hours of time to drink the tea. And the rent for that was a wolf's tongue uh, because he had throat uh, problems and that's the best medicine in the, in the shaman uh, world. And by accident, our uh, local producer still had one wolf's tongue in his refrigerator. So it was, <laughs> was this kind of, and we would have never reached our goal if we would just have gone there and said like here are one thousand dollars for a day give us please the please give us the machine that wouldn't wouldn't have reached the goal so you really have to be empathic for that um, society you you have to become part of and uh, then then you have all the advantages that for a professional production coming from our grid of how to making films from the Western world, it would be just troubling that it was a real positive experience. Well, it sounds like you have to be a little bit, you know, patient and, you know, that you're not on your agenda, you're more on theirs yeah. and just kind of, you know, be a little more organic with it. Did that make it, did that make, does that make the shoot longer because of that? Just because you need to sort of take your time and, you know, I mean, it also sounds like it would be a more pleasant experience in many ways that, you know, you're following the whole of time in a way. Yeah, I would say more like it used up all the, the weekends to do this kind of uh, discussion, which is also uh, not work because you learn, you, 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 know them and 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 you have really great stories uh, you hear great stories that they tell about the whole regions etc so yeah you have to be there uh, as a person and you want you have to have the the need or the want to to integrate there and not just um, come there as an alien to shoot and then go go away again and the same is also with the contexts that are still um, like uh, the communication is still on a weekly basis at least to all the teams so. and, and in most you know I mean I, I've seen a few films about Mongolia of course some of the Ambus films but also but mo I would say I don't think in any of them I've ever seen um, a character with a cell phone or YouTube or or even cars, really. Can you talk about how some of those more modern or Western, you know, commodities have made their way into the culture and daily life and how that intersects with their traditional nomadic lifestyle? Yeah. Um, it's more and more integrated there. So the first time when we sh uh, shot the um, story of the we weeping camel, we had no communication at all. It was in 2002, I think. Um, on the countryside, there, the next telephone was in Ulaanbaatar, Ulaanbaatar which was like uh, 3,000 kilometers away. Um, on the uh, story, uh, on the Cave of the Yellow Dog, the second film in 2008, I think it was, um, there was a telephone in the next Zoom, the next village, uh, which was like one and a half hours to drive. And every second day it worked. <laughs> um, so sometimes you drove this one and a half hours and it just, just didn't work. <laughs> um, and on the um, Two Horses film, suddenly you were in the middle of uh, the stepland and you had edge or, or low, um, not internet, but telephone quality uh, connection. And if you climbed up the hill and if sometimes you even had to throw up your cell phone <laughs> some meters higher, then you could, could send away a message. Um, 
And the next time I was there, it was 3G almost everywhere um, in this, this surrounding steplands of, of UB, like uh, two, two, hour, uh, two days of uh, car ride from, from UB, you're, you had the full coverage. And this is, of course, um, the thing that, that also affects the nomads. So nearly all the nomads somehow now have a possibility to access um, the internet or uh, so this is, is, yeah, creeping in there or, or coming into the culture as well. And how is it affecting their culture? In particular, I would imagine generationally. I mean, obviously you can see the kids are, you know, like every kid wants to just binge on YouTube and, and is totally obsessed with their screens. And obviously that's not the culture that their parents came from. And, um, and yet, you know, they'll go home then and be part of that traditional culture. Like how is that impacting or is it, is it having any sort of uh, negative or, or other, you know, impact on, on sort of that family and the, just the, the community dynamic? Yeah. And like the old days in Mongolia, it was really great to travel the countryside because you never felt like a tourist. When you, you entered a yurt, you were the one who they, they um, you, you were the news. You were, the, uh, you were not the tourist uh, that went there to, to watch the people, but they watched you because they didn't move so much. And so, uh, and they ask you everything about your family, of course, about your country. And we had some photos with us. So we were YouTube for them. Um, and now there is YouTube. So this need of, of um, communication or news or, or information coming from outside, decreased um, in the younger generation on the countryside. And of course, by knowing so much more about the, um, the luxury and, and the things that you um, could have in the uh, bigger towns or um, at least in, in the capital, Yulambata, um, the, the need or the sign to, to go there is much bigger in the younger generation. So I think the, the development will be much more in the direction that the nomads are getting fewer and fewer and the uh, citizens of Ulaanbaata will, will increase. How, so can you talk a little bit about the father's car? I found that car so fascinating because of course, at first glance, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't get a Mercedes. And then of course later, like that's, that's obviously, it's not a Mercedes. And I love that, that how they sort of talk about that, you know, the, the what's, what's it called? The piece on the front, the- The star, the, 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 star, yeah, the yeah. logo. Uh, <laughs> but, but I kept wondering how they use that car year round with no top on it. And so I was just wondering like how you came about incorporating that car just as a, as a prop, you know, obviously it's so critical to the, um, to the accident scene and how things transpire, but I'm just curious, you know, about how the, the actual car itself of how you kind of came to that. Um, this is also from, from our experience in, in Mongolia. Um, the, the, um, the Mongolians themselves, they call it to Mongolianize, I would roughly translate it. Uh, so they are really good in gluing things together. Um, once uh, I, we had a car breakdown in the middle of Gobi and the driver just had um, some Chinese glue, um, some alufoil, is that the right word for it? Like Armenian? Um, and uh, shoe, how is it called? Shoe tie? Uh, shoelace. So, yeah. Um, and I was like, literally the vultures were above us already. And he with his three tools was like four hours underneath the car and then he restarted it and it went. Uh, we we it we could could leave that that desperate like Mongolian MacGyver. Yeah, yeah, they they are all MacGyvers. Like I think MacGyver could be their student. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, and this, this we somehow wanted to integrate, especially um, also having this, um, because of course a car also stands for fossil energy. Um, so it's also the thing that also the nomads are not uh, some like they they are transforming themselves, uh, having this zero carbon footprint into something in between. Um, so we wanted to to give a bit of this experience of the Mongolianization and the bitter sweetness also of this development into it. Uh, we don't didn't want to make him a horse whisperer, uh, which would be much more stereotype for that. So that's how we got to that. And yeah, and um, the the uh, sabotaging of, of the machines uh, is actually my own uh, history. Uh, I'm, like I was fighting against um, uh, like people dis, uh, w that wanted to, to cut down trees in my hometown in the middle of Germany. And I went there at night and put sugar into the, <laughs> the tanks. <laughs> Um, so, like from every one of the of the crew, somehow uh, something went into the film, uh, and that merged to the final uh, experience there. <laughs> so, can you talk a little bit about this, the scenes um, where I just have, I'm wondering how hard it was for for Amra, the, the young actor that played Amra, to shoot those scenes where he's sent down into the mine into that deep narrow hole and. Um, you know, I, maybe how you shot that—it just seems so claustrophobic and, and potentially dangerous, and um, and also seems like it would be really hard to shoot. Yeah, um, that's the magic of film. <laughs> um, no, like of course we sh shot there in the in this uh, ninja um, mining fields. Ninja—they are called ninjas because they used to wear the 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 bolts the green bolts where they wash the um um the gold out on the back so they looked like ninja turtles that's mm -hmm. where they they have their name from um there it was really dangerous because the holes were everywhere so we really had to take care by, uh, by at the shooting and all the team was very sensitive about that, and uh, but once one from the from the producer's office came with his laptop in and watched the laptop, and he fall into a hole that didn't broke anything. So uh, that was uh, yeah, um, and the the shots inside the hole we recreated them. So we we had. Um, uh, a wall uh, from from a mining uh, where we could um, just dig the hole in that we had the uh, the front open so the the boy was not in danger down there. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those holes. I mean, they just I've I've never seen a mining city where they were so narrow. You know, like usually they create these big mine shafts, and you know, it's just interesting the way that it like it seems like it's sort of like they've just poked holes all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, uh, when I was young I went to Potosi in Bolivia to the to the Silver Mountain there and there I experienced that and s since I was there as a young one inside a hole I will never go again. So um it's really claustrophobic. Yeah. Especially um, when you hear the detonations of dynamite somewhere around. It's, right, and you don't know how close it is to you and Yeah. Um, so to talk a little more about the, the cinematography in general, it's so beautiful. I mean, obviously the landscape is so beautiful, but can you, can you talk about the choices that, that Biamba made and how it was shot and, and what kind of feeling she wanted the camera work to evoke? Um, like, is she, she wanted, of course, to, to, to contradict the, the beautiness of, of the countryside with the, with the destruction. Um, so, um, throughout the film, we we used 
longer and longer lenses that we sh could shrink the background more and more with the foreground. That even though that you you have the same general setting in the beginning, the the minds somehow felt much more far away. And then throughout the shoot, they're coming closer and closer by the visualization of, of the DOP, Talal Khuri. Um, and yeah, that, that was the general approach um, on, on the shooting that we wanted to start with the width and the openness of um, this beautiful country and want to create some kind of claustrophobia um, in the end. And then when they are starting off in the end with a, with a car towards um, the, the Mongolia Scat Talent Show, there we opened up again to, to create this. So we wanted to, in an open space, we wanted also to create some kind of claustrophobia um, in the, in the villa, visualization. Right. So, so, but obviously most also just as important as the visual is, is the sound. And, and I'm wondering uh, if maybe you could talk a little bit about where you are and, um, and, and your work on the sound in this film, you in fact are, are, are a sound designer, I think primarily by, by, by trade and maybe talk a little bit about how you worked on the sound and, and that lovely space that you're in. Yet, um, I'm not just the, the producer or one of the producers of the sound. I'm also one of the re-recording mixers, uh, which is my uh, side uh, profession, uh, the way you look at it, or producing is my side prof profession. Um, uh, um, yeah, so, and I also did the, the set recordings for several films of Biambazu and Dava before and the sound design and mixing. So I pretty much knew what, what uh, will be the, the tasks on this film. But of course, there was something new because the, the development of the, the song in the end was something that we... Um, also did beside the the shooting so we we try to to with the with the experiences that amra that the boy made throughout the film and the real encounters that he also um, got there try to develop a mood for for the the uh, piece of for the winds of the world piece um and recorded it in the yurt, uh, like Mongolia is perfect, by the way, for sound recording, <laughs> even I can do it there because the houses don't have any solid walls. <laughs> they are just uh, uh, cloth and uh, anywhere else you have just the width uh, with wonderful atmospheres. So um, um, that that is really uh, um, great and nice to take. So we, Every third evening of the the shoot, we went with Amra into the into the yurt and tried to to make an interpretation of um, the experience he made in the in the song. And this is how the the song also developed throughout the the shooting. And the same with the like the the camera work. Of course, we had. Um, the the idea to first have this yeah the the nature and the openness and then s suddenly this this encounter of machines come into and uh, from that moment they are nearly present in every scene until they get sabotaged by the kids and um, that this is also when you don't see it always an element that that is stressing the scenes um, was of course already um, in the script um, when you have a sound designer working on the script as well. So all these ideas of course are, are made before. So, um, so are you in your recording studio right now? Yes. Yes. Is that where you recorded veins? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, where we we did the mixing from Wings of the World and all the music uh, pre-production, yeah, and where we finalized it together with Bema. 
Oh, fantastic. So as you said, you've worked with Bimba on some on several of her previous films, which which all take place in Mongolia and tend to focus on children as main characters. Um, can you talk a little bit about Biamba's um, connection to Mongolia and, and, and why she prefers younger protagonists for her stories? And do any of these stories reflect her own experiences growing up there? Yeah, Biamba came with the age, I think, of somewhere um, in the late 20s to, to Germany. And um, until then, she, she lived in Ulaanbaatar, which also means like every Mongolian that lives in Ulaanbaatar, that she's on the countryside nearly all summer um, with some relatives or um, friends or whatever. So every, nearly every Mongolian that is in, lives in UB also have a relation to, to um, the, the nomad's life. I think the step coming over here um, and in my um, opinion the great thing that that Biamba does is that she somehow sh shares both she has the the spirit of the nomad's life in herself but also um, have had the possibility or the ability to to have a look from outside on what is right, what uh, what is right, what is wrong in the society of of Mongolia, and and uh, has uh, the ability to um, to highlight the things that that also give us something that we are sighing for or that we can learn from. And um, so this this is her background uh, coming here. The first, very first documentary she made was about um, uh, a Mongolian band who moved over to Germany um, and tried to to survive here, um, which which was also interesting to to um, to draw a picture. From, like herself coming over to this this foreign um, society, and then there was the the look back and the look back to with the the things that she was missing here in the society, and the, uh, on the other hand, um, having also a focus on the globalization that takes place in Mongolia and let this um, this heritage somehow disappear over the year or at least change a lot and there was with the story of the weeping camel which which was almost completely in this nomad's society without any influences from outside that's why she put the last scene there where they suddenly had a um, satellite uh, bowl is it called um right. Yeah, in in front of the the tent, where this invasion of of the Western world um, started, and that was in this trilogy of films uh, with the story of the Weeping Camel, Cave of the Yellow Duck, and now Wains of the World, um, the continuous um, uh, process, um, which somehow stands quite symbolic for the status quo that was in Mongolia in these periods. So, what would you, what, what would you like viewers, particularly American viewers, and also particularly our, some of our younger viewers? You know, we're sharing this with um, school groups as part of our education program, and so that we, you know, have a lot of younger viewers watching. What would you want them most to take away from the film? Um, the first thing is that um, courage and, and doing things that you believe in, that they are right, and then gathering under this umbrella of, of uh, ideas and visions and things you don't want to have, that this is the most important thing that every single one of us has to take a chance by 
And this, uh, this is a global thing. And um, you have it in, in USA, uh, we have it here in, in, um, in Europe as well with, uh, we have a lot of problems with right wing parties now coming up and, and we somehow building up a fortress uh, taking like, you know, all the minings there over in Mongolia are uh, made by, by Europeans or Canadians or um, some Chinese, some Americans, some New Zealand uh, companies. So none of the profits we take from that land and where we, we, we uh, destroy the life of the nomads is is given to the people there and on the other hand we building our walls higher and that's unfair so um every good that travel sh or the, every border there should be a basic rule that th the goods that travel beyond that border uh, the the humans should at least have the same rights than the goods and I think then everything would be more in balance. And yeah, I think like Amra in the film, even though that he's just a little voice, he found the way to put his little voice on a big stage. And he reached something with that. And I think this is the this essential thing I would love to that that you will take it with you from the film that it's uh, we're not weak we just have to find our amplifiers to to raise our voice to change something that's a great that's great thank you so much Oscar it's been so great to talk to you and to, to hear more about the film thank you so much for making the film beautiful we love I just love it it really is one of my favorites of the year and um, it's been it's been great to get to know a little bit more. So thank you for your time. Was my pleasure. All the best. Thanks. <laughs>